welcome to Brett's with Friends, my 90th episode. Hold on, I don't have any fucking light. <laughs> We've made it to the 90th episode, and I'm very happy to welcome a very special guest, Mr. William Attaway, artist, sculptor, visionary, uh, father, um, actor in my film Salome back in the day. How are you, sir? I am okay. Awesome. Well, um, hey, can you tell us a little bit about um, your past? Uh, in a, I like to do sort of a, a past, present, and future sort of situation. And if there's anything you want to talk about that you're passionate about that I'm not asking you about, or One better question at a time, please. Okay. Uh, how are you? Happy 2023. I am well, and I'm glad to know it's 23. I feel like I'm I'm um, 32 going on 64, but you know it's okay. I could deal with much more. Yes, yes, yes. Bring it, bring it on. Um, so can we get a little uh, dive uh, about your past? Like where you're born, your upbringing. I was born, I was born in New York City, out of my mother's beautiful womb from my father's loins. He was from uh, Mississippi, he was part of the Harlem Renaissance. He lived at the Ellison with uh, Romeo Bearden and all the great writers there. He wrote music um, with his dear friend, Harry Belafonte, he wrote his first book, um, came out, uh, uh, Let Me Breathe Thunder, Blood on the Forge. Um, he also was the first black writer on television, um, The Colgate Hour. My mom moved from upstate New York, a white woman. Her family owned some places near where my father had a coffee shop with Harry Belafonte. And um, she ended up having coffee there and and um, they ended up hooking up together. And there, next thing I know, I was a multiracial baby of a whole new millennium of a new generation. You know, understand what I'm saying? I put it into a little nutshell, but sometimes you got to collapsalize it so you can collapsalize it for everybody else to see word so when be, did you know when did you start doing art um i always did art my um my mom and dad were both artists so we always made art at home when um when i was two or four we moved to the caribbean and um so in barbados we were pretty isolated my mom was from new york and she did a lot of incredible art which i'll talk about later but she kept us busy with it, making sculptures and, and um, collecting shells and making shell frames to um, doing everything, you know. And so I would enter writing competitions in Barbados and drawing competitions, painting competitions. And um, I remember my first sale was to the um, ambassador of uh, Canada when I was nine or eight years old. I did a painting of a lunchbox that I had. I, I experienced New York City and we did a, a blimpy sandwich. It was like this big of cold cuts and all the shit. And in Barbados, you get like one little slither of, of ham with one little <laughs> slither of lettuce and a little sprinkle of hot sauce. And this sandwich was that thick, like New York kosher style, you know? So I made a painting of that. And the, 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 um, the Canadian ambassador wanted to buy it at this competition. It had a red white tablecloth and a lunch box and the sandwich there i remember i think i have it in storage I, I hope i do but long story short is he wanted to buy it and i was like buy it no i'll rent it to you <laughs> and i rented it to him for 50 dollars a month for four <laughs> years four years at nine years old man let me tell you that's money that's 50 dollars barbadians it's like like you know it was crazy so like he Ended up losing his residency as whatever it was, ambassador to Barbados. He had to go back and he took the painting with him and I freaked out. And so he eventually sent it back to us and 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 it all worked out. But that's when I knew I was a businessman and I knew I was an artist and art, you know, I, I knew what it was to make something out of nothing and get something from nothing and enjoy it so greatly. That's pretty wild to have that experience as a nine-year-old child to to be organizing and stuff like that. When you um 
when you did that, when was your next sale? Uh, or did you continue? Well, on you got to remember too, I was on the beach in Barbados. So where I was living, it was a very poor neighborhood in Barbados in St. James. And so we didn't know what Christmas was. I didn't know what Halloween was. There was no toy store. We'd make our own toys. Um, and so when tourists would come down, my mom said, Christmas is a good time to make Christmas wreaths out of the casuarina trees. And we make fake Christmas wreaths and we go sell them at the doors. And, you know, at the same time, all the kids would make jewelry out of wire and stuff. There was people making stuff for tourists and, and locals also. So we always made something out of nothing. And um, but I think my my first real sale was idea of that was was that ambassador. And I thought, you know, he paid me that was over five years, fifty dollars a month. That was a good amount of money. Yeah. And when I moved to America, I had that in my pocket, you know, and it was it was um, I never forgot that. And uh, did you ever stay back over in New York after your family moved out of there or do you ever what? Because I know that you uh, went to. I wanted to get into the Woodstock and the music stuff too, but okay. we're, 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 we're working up to that. We're working up to that. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, like um, my auntie, um, Aunt Ruth, Ruth Morrison Attaway, she was an actress, incredible actress in New York City. She was in Being There. Um, she was the old black lady who said crazy fucking white people. You know, it was, <laughs> if you've ever seen Being, being There, you sh you'll understand what I'm talking about. But she had an acting studio in New York and um, she made jewelry. And and so when I got to New York, we really discovered the diaspora of Africa and, and Moroccan beads. And she had a, and I really rejoiced in going into New York City and, and staying in, I wish I could remember the name of the street, but it was like Puerto Ricans, everybody, the fire hydrant was blaring and the water was out and playing stickball on the street. It was real New York back in the day, you know, in the 70s. And um, and so like coming there and and then understanding living in a really poor neighborhood in Barbados with not a well wealthy family, but a well to do family, we we um, I got to experience a little bit of both, you know, and at a certain point, my parents realized in Barbados that I they couldn't understand what I was saying. I was talking a different language. Right. And they, yeah. they, they, they said, well, we want to move you to another we want to move you to another district. <laughs> they got me into the more uh, affluent areas of Barbados, and um, and I was in those schools, you know, and um, and then eventually we moved to America, which was incredible for me because um, I I um, I mean the reason we did move there was because I won the Queen's competition for art in Barbados, and um, and that's a big thing. All the Commonwealth colonies at that time would have artists of all ages and groups submit art and they would be judged and they could go to the Buckingham Palace and they'd be all put on display, right? Mm -hmm. The fuck now, right? Yeah. But, uh, but um, for in the Caribbean, that was a big deal, you know, and I won. And because I was an American citizen and I moved there when I was two years old, when my stuff got there, but my mom was the director of the whole thing to help all the ba Barbadian kids and everybody put their art out and it wasn't no nepotism there. It was basically, I won. I had the best painting, you know, and they sent it back because one mother complained because I wasn't Barbadian oh. and, and it broke my heart. So I was like, I want to move to America. You know, my dad at the time was working in Hollywood writing. And um, for me, it was great. I mean, I loved coming to America when we came here that first week and I was like skateboarding and surfing all in one place, Venice beach and, how old were you? Yes, I was 12, 13. Oh shit, right in the yeah, pocket. bro. I had one of those skateboards that were see-through blue and the oh. little <laughs> wheels. I would I was rolling, man. And um, you know, Taco Bell and fucking uh, you know, it was you know, the brown derby, you know, I'd go sit in there with my parents, you know, all the mm -hmm. old school Hollywood shit, you know. But I, I learned I learned a lot, man, about America and how Back then, Hollywood was brutal, man. It was punk rockers in the street, homeless people. Like, as amount of homeless Hollywood people- Hollywood is still pretty brutal. <laughs> well, I mean, but like the home, like how you see homeless across LA now, it was like that up and down Hollywood and Santa Monica Boulevard for two miles. And that was that guy for years and no one dealt with it until the LA Olympics came along in 84. 
And I had my studio in Venice and I saw them pick up people in full semi trucks and put them and drive them down there to Venice Beach and put them on the boardwalk right there on the beach. You know, like homeless guys with like in a wheelchair with bags around him, 25 feet around him. And they brought all his stuff down there and set him up down there for while the Olympics are going in 84. And, and no one came to Venice, you know, because it was all back. It was horses back in the valley and it was a different scene. But um, but I, I seen a lot of changes in L.A., man. And um, I, I digress. I don't know where I went through, but um, I went there. But um, we're send me back, brother. Well, I mean, I actually want to talk to you about Stephen Johnson's a name that I just thought up, who was a really great king, amazing. the king, the great artist. Here's to Stephen Johnson. Here's to Stephen Johnson. Wait, click. Mathematician, a neuro. He worked, um, not neuro. He worked with um, NASA on. Um, I forget it. He was a mathematician. He had a baritone voice. <laughs> yeah, very. I mean, he could have been um, a thespian to the nth he was like he he could have been on star trek or anything you know he i saw was, he was amazing i saw his sketchbook one time he showed me a sketchbook yeah you know this was about the time that you know the alien with the you know almond eyes and stuff like that was i have one of his i had one of his baby aliens as a a, a tile on my floor in the bathroom in dudley i didn't take yes. that picture of it but um really amazing artist homeless apparently or went homeless at some point i know you're really good friends with him um maybe i can put up an image of one of his pieces or something like that i know that brad neal's a collector oh. got some of his um postpartum uh, or post uh after his passing but so like steve, steve basically when i first saw him on the boardwalk he was painting on tiles and spray painting and putting layer over layer over layer with pencils so they look like tiles and i dealt with ceramics and so i wanted to bring him because he was using spray paint and spraying it directly in his face and I could see it collecting on it. He had beautiful skin. That was spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> you always did have a sort no of joke. No, that was that was that was the clear sealer. He was spraying <laughs> over and over. That's a nice but, uh, uh, satin. So, so that that actually, I got him to come into the studio, and he worked for me for a while, and he slept on the floor. He worked with me as an apprentice for a long time, about a year actually, not a long time. And um, unfortunately, he had an, another side that I couldn't really see through he was touched um and you couldn't get into his past he, he didn't really talk talk about many things um he i would come in in the morning and the place would be a mess and he would have it clean in a half hour and there was a, a baggage of guilt around him but at the same time when you saw his art there was a richness of heart and 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 positivity and focus and and no matter what kind of day he had or what kind of dreams he had that night, he would come alive during his paintings. You could see it in them. And I wish, you know, um, I, I had set up a show with him um, for the Art Walk, his first show. And I think it overwhelmed him. And, and he um, disappeared for about three, four, four or five days. And I don't know what happened to him. He came back. He wasn't the same person. Um, and um, he he wasn't taking care of himself right. And I, 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 man, you know, we need mechanisms to help artists out because we all go through things. I've gone through my own hiccups in life, you know, where um, I've been fortunate enough to give enough for people have helped me and give back. But if you don't have a springboard to spring up against, you're lost by yourself, you know? And he found himself up in the hills in Hollywood sleeping up there underneath the Hollywood sign and he was um taken from us that night and it, it wasn't a good thing and um Brad and I and Joey Ector I received the news and um I had to talk to his mom and I you got to remember at this time this brother would sit on the boardwalk and talk about things that were so wise and he was in the conspiracy theories too, remember? Yeah. He could tell oh, yeah. you about any conspiracy theory and all that stuff. The aliens, he would draw you a most beautiful fairy and at the same time draw you an alien and then draw and tie in the, the pyramids of Egypt, right? And so like, we didn't really know much about him. None of us did. And so I got this call and I said, I got the number of his family and I had to call them and, and told them about what's going on. And 
we had a, a service for him in downtown LA and Joey Ector and the bass player, the great musician of Venice and, and Brad Neal, the, um, the most loved and most hated realtor in Venice, but the most credible human being there is, don't listen to the hype. Love but, um, Brad Neal. Brad Neal's the boss. He's great. Yeah, we're all, you know what? We all are sons of beautiful, beautiful people. So don't forget what we all come from. Long story short is we go to the service and and it's in, I forget where, West, downtown LA, maybe maybe Compton, I don't, I don't remember. And and his aunt, his mother and auntie and uncle are there and they're all irate with Steve because he had let down on his career working at Northrop Grumman and he was an engineer of science. And, and I was like, no wonder this guy could do the technology thing, you know? And mm -hmm. so they were just spiteful. They weren't wondering where the money was, right? So then I get up there and I talk about his art. Brad gets up there and talks about his spirituality. Joey gets up there and plays the flute and talks about how he connected the whole community. And then these people are crying, you know, and and then he's all along. I don't give a damn. I still want that goddamn money. Where the fuck am I going to put it? But like this man is intellectual. And at the same time, he'd been living in the gutter. I mean, he he was living he was living in the gutter you know and um i didn't but, really know that that much when i knew when so, I knew let me tell you let me finish it up in a positive note because it yeah. sounds rough because it's very complicated so we left that that time of rejoicement for steve johnson a dear friend a dear artist a dear person that we knew very little about and we learned so much more because it turned out that he was a clear thinker of industry and, and making six figures covering his whole family and he cracked and slipped out and he went to the edges of Venice like a lot of us do and discovered himself as an artist in which he always wanted to be he didn't want to be this corporate person he had told me you know and um I, I, they know that's what I think. I feel like Venice is a gear, a mechanism, a porthole that, that sometimes finds people looking for their, their better selves at the same time, because of the mechanisms that I hear that trick us, they, they find us our worst sides of ourselves, you know, and I've been part of that, you know, and, and, and it's like, we really need to share the stories of the better sides of how Venice has helped people. And, and, um, because the the drugs and 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 everything else is another story but really the beauty and the creativity and the captive disneyland has nothing on venice you understand me <laughs> that's it <laughs> that's it steve johnson is a king right uh -huh. you know that's it steve davis is a king another artist you know there's a whole fleet of women who are artists here i've never even talked about which i wish i could I, I'm just a, a little drip in the drop of the people who have come through here who are creative and who are still creating like yourself and, um, and, um, and how do you, how do you, okay. So you're, you're a multimedia artist. You, you do many, 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 many different types of stuff. Um, how do you, um, I don't know, like the sculpture and the paintings, you can tell that, but it was done with it by the same hand. The physics and the character and the emotion and the the personality are in there. Um, is there a moment where you like, okay, well, I'm done with painting for a little bit. I'll sculpt right now. How do you organize your different medias? You know what I I I remember when I was when I was 16 years old, I was hanging out with people who were working out with Sheila E and then Prince and everybody. And my his name was Scotty, right? And Scotty, I was hanging in the studio, sleeping on the floor. And I was doing pottery back then, and I was selling at like flea markets, Compton swap meat, all of them. And it was fucking rough, man. He had come <laughs> on with the bucks, right? Those flea pots. I'm not joking. 16 years old, man. You had those little hands. You had the little hands in there. The faces and <laughs> shit. Little faces. And I used to make wizard and gnomes. I'd be at the Renaissance fairs. I worked for a lot of people. But then I, I started hanging with this guy, Scotty, and the freaky executives in the Bay Area and this musician. And he was started hanging out with Sheila E. And 
all these people, and I saw them making music every morning. At early in the morning, I get up and I help them. And I was good at words. I was never good at rhythm, you know. And I was like, I was like, wake up in the morning, fix a piece of toast. I start looking for the jam that I like the most, <laughs> a pop peach and a mom. And and like I, uh, with these guys. and then I started writing my own things with these guys. And they were like, dude you make good art. Why don't you do the same thing in the morning? That's what Scotty told me. So I came back to Venice. I started making pots with Brian Scheller and, and who I started with. And, and we started that little spot down there in Venice, um, 334 Venice, Santa, uh, Sunset Avenue, excuse me. And um, Brian Scheller was my mentor with that. He was 16. I was 16. That's a whole nother story. Jesus. <laughs> I got the music. Actually, you know what brought me to everything is Brian Scheller. Brian <laughs> Scheller. He was, he went through Synanon. He went through, he was 16 years old. I met him at the pot shop on Santa Monica Boulevard. And he and I um, hit it off and we work all night. And, you know, it was like, I never met anybody to make this many pots. And he'd be like, you know, he'd have art shows. He was, he was an incredible guy. And, and we just, and he said, I have this art studio in Venice that we could rent for a hundred dollars a month each. And I said, nice. And I told my dad, and he, my dad said, well, I'll give you the hundred bucks, you know? And he didn't know I was dropping out of school at that time. I was ditching school. <laughs> but I'll tell you that story. That's one other story. But but Brian was an integral part of my my whole upbringing. And, and um, we'd go to Zookie's every night at three o'clock in the morning. We'd make pots from, from about six o'clock till six in the morning at any studio we could find and they kick us out because we make so many pots 300 <laughs> a night and then we we're losing rent. money on this man we're losing money <laughs> Brentwood art show the Belleville's art show we go to those and and you know it was crazy I was the first time at the Belleville's art show in 1981 and I had probably about 400 pieces set up mosaics all carved and all handmade you know and at that time there was no African-American people in the Belleville's art show I'm going to tell you straight up, no black, brown people at the, at the Bell Hills Art Show. No, no, no. And and I, I lived around there. I lived up the street at Elizabeth Montgomery's house. You know, my best friend, Bill Asher, was helping me. He got me into clay. And, and you know, I, li I lived in Beverly Hills. So I always saw the show. So I applied for it and I got in there. And and it was incredible. The, my first show, I sold out. I had 300 pieces. And, man, I made 10 grand cash. Nice. Like, 17 years old i was like what fuck, fuck yeah fuck? dude you know and and um and i remember like people come up to me says like like and the next year was incredible you know and then so things just took off i from there i started working with hotels and and i started working with um the ashkenazi group and and um i did every little hotel d designers dealers and um um i started working in the art shows out in and um where was it what's his name man the the, the guy out in um uh it, it was you know all these trade shows were great at the time because you could meet people who were working on hotels and you could be out there with no middleman right yeah and that was the 80s and the early 90s you know and then it changed you know on um and then for me my big point was when i met dudley moore and Dudley Moore, he he changed my life, man. That was that was my king, bro, King Dudley. Nice. Tell us a story about him. So I was at the Beverly Hills Art Show, and this guy comes up, this designer. He says, "I have a I have an art job for you." He's from um, very avant garde, very flamboyant guy, and he had a scarf just like mine, beautiful guy. <laughs> and he said, "I'm not sure. If you, have you ever done a mosaic?" And I was like, "Yeah, I could do a mosaic." So he takes me down there, and he shows me Dudley's house right by the end of the. Um, the Marini Del Rey Pier. And I really don't know who I'm working for, but I draw it up and I draw a sink with two hands coming out. The water was coming out the spigots and it was a whole bowl made on a pottery wheel. And behind it was, by then I learned who it was and it had Dudley came with these ideas. He was such a great comedian. He was like, I want all the fish. His girlfriend's name was Brogan at the time. And all the fish that before me, no, after me get eaten except for me because I'm the only one and he has a golden chain around his neck. And there are all these really um, simple designs of fish, you know, back then. And then we just, I did a 10 by 10 wall and I did his son's shower, a 20 foot wall. And we work for, I mean, in the morning, he, I come in there, he'd be like, Hey, Atoy, let's smoke a joint and eat 
you know, eat Brussels sprouts and eggs. We'd smoke a joint, drink champagne and shit. Perfect. I, was like, I love this guy, you know? So I'm finally getting my whole wall set up in the bathroom down there. And the designer had jipped me on the price and I've never set tile in my whole life, you know? So the designer says, I was getting four grand for a 10 by 10 wall, plus the sink and everything. There's nothing, right? So I'm setting all this stuff. I'm cutting the holes in it. I don't know what I'm doing. But I didn't know you're supposed to set the wall two foot, two foot at a time for mosaic for a tile. So I set the whole wall and pushed it up. And by the time I was done, it fell and it just <laughs> and that was right when I was sitting with Dudley. And Dudley starts laughing his ass. <laughs> and the designer is just like irate. You're fired. And designer and Dudley's just like, this is hilarious. I'll pay him double, you know. And I'm crying. I'm crying. And I was pissed because I but I told Dudley that I don't know how to set tile. He says, well, you forced him to set tile. Dudley was a righteous guy. So long story short is I've had a, three, a few whiskeys, guys. So yeah. bear with me. No, I'm tracking Dudley. you. I'm tracking you. Okay. So Dudley basically had the designer pay for the installer to do it next time to teach me. At this same period of time in 1984, my father died that week. And I didn't show up for a week. And the designer was just going nuts on me. And I showed up and he cussed me out in front of Dudley. He didn't know that I had told Dudley that my dad had died. And I'm going to leave to Barbados for a month or two where I, I was raised. And I just, I had to get out of here, you know. And Dudley was like, Bill, this, no problem. Here, take another hit, chill out, you know. And yeah. it, just like that, right. And the designer comes in, he starts cussing me out. You're fired. You'll never, you've had one wall fall and all this shit, right? And Dudley comes in here and he goes, not only is he not fired, you're fired. And they made up afterwards, right? Yeah. But, but basically Dudley goes, not only that, I'm paying for Bill's ticket to fly to Barbados, to take his dad's ashes to be buried down there. You know, he gave me four grand cash, you know, and take as long as you want. And when you come back, then you finish all your artwork here. There's no pressure here, right? Yeah. And so I came back, right? I found out that the designer died of AIDS. Yeah, I didn't know anything about it. The guy, no wonder he was so angry all the time. Dudley was incredible. I finished the whole project with him. Jeez. And he had 72 Market Street at the time, you know, with Robert Graham and all that stuff. And yeah. he invited me down there. And so I'm a young kid, you know, 20 something years old. I go down there to, and it's like Liza Minnelli on the piano and Dudley's introducing me to everybody. Nice. I, I freaked out and I ran outside. Never came. <laughs> I, I never came back to 72 Market Street. Mark my words. So that deadly send me invites to all his birthdays and everything because I was so nervous. I, I had so self esteem, I think. Wow. I didn't really know how. And you're also processing. I, the I didn't know how incredible I was. And like how we, we both should know how incredible we are as people, right? Yeah, yeah. We are, we are sentient beings, you know? And so until you become a star, then you think that these stars are sentient beings. Dudley was just a regular person like me, you know? Yeah. So long story short is I, I get the commission to do the Venice boardwalk down there and like the 20 foot column and all this stuff. And I'm down there and I'm like freaking out and the architect is there and, and they're loving it, you know, and I'm loving it. I'm dreams come true. I call it. And I'm thinking of Dudley. I really am. And he's long dead. And so I leave the boardwalk. And so what happens is one day the, the person who bought 72 Market Street, Joseph, which became the Globe Restaurant, um, Joseph was at the column and he says he was standing there with this guy and it turned out to be the lead architect of the boardwalk. Wow, yeah. He would talk to me and he said, who did the sculpture? And he says, William Attaway. And then Joseph calls me up, the owner of Globe. And lo and behold, this is the same place that Dudley Moore owned. So Dudley's still with me. And I did all the dinnerware, all the plates for a Globe restaurant, all the new sculptures in there and, and got to meet all the people and start to learn about my self-worth. Mm -hmm. And and so I got to bring a lot of the community in there also. You know, we'd bring a table and oh, serve yeah. $3,000 dinner to all the homeless, you know, the young youth and shit, man. And I got to hang out with stars and everything. And and and, and it was an incredible time, you know. And um, so like Dudley was always there, you know, and and. I don't know, man. It's um, Venice is it's a 
incredible place if you pay attention. Um, I wish I'd pay attention a little bit more, but now I am. And um, I, that's one thing I want to tell any artist or any young, anybody, fuck artists, any person. I tell my kids this all the time. Paying attention is attention to yourself. When you're not paying attention to you and all that's around you, you're not taking care of what's around you. And therefore, it's not self-worth. You know, um, love is, you understand what I'm saying? I hear it. I hear it. There you go. Hey, those um rubber gram pillars are they still in that market? The that restaurant uh, covered up with a with a wall, fake wall. They uncover them for the new place. Which really? Is yeah. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I got. It took me a while to get my because when um the new place opened, I had done the sculptures in there. They got rid of them, and I that's another story. I finally yeah. got my artwork back out of there, also, and which is a dream come true. Nice. So the call the rubber gram columns. They're back. They've always been there. They're part they're of always the neighbors, never left. They're <laughs> actually part of the infrastructure of the building. You can't take them out. They cover them up when the Korean company bought the place. <laughs> they opened that sushi place and then they put. Uh, yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, I mean, they don't even understand the worth of it. I mean, <laughs> that's, are, that's worth more than the building. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I remember uh, when I was watching Carlos because I. Lived uh, near there in the beginning days. Juan of- Carlos. Car- love Heaven. Love- Heaven. Juan Carlos. Carlos. When he'd be doing patinas to um, Rubber Graham's uh, Gabby's on the outside, and Angelica Houston was around the corner. We ended up becoming friends later. But um, but uh, watching him do that and the sculptures and you looking guys, through- You would walk dogs and always bump into each other, right? Yeah, we used to walk our dogs together. Yeah, I remember you told me that story. That was crazy. We never talked about Hollywood at all. We just talked about horses and and dogs and stuff like that. Well, that you know, that's because you're grimy and gritty like that, bro. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I am. Well, she's a really she was really lovely to me always. I I am, uh, I would love to get her. It'd be crazy to get her on the podcast. I know she's just chilling out in Palisades, but she's uh, that'd be funny. Um, I know some people are still for. careful what you ask for. Oh, I'd love to talk to her. Uh, but uh, she is lovely, lovely, lovely. Then they, you know, Robert Graham died, and that was uh, then they the king. The king. Yeah, man, I should have got one of those Gabbies when I had the chance. Carlos is gonna give me one for a thousand dollars, and I didn't have the money like that at the time. But he's all, you, you, want oh, <laughs> you, you want one? What's that? You got fifty now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was so good. His sculptures, the way those skin, you could see the skin. On the bone, it was nuts. Yeah, you know, Gabby, she, I think they both had an incredible connection. Those two. Yeah, really great. And I went out with this girl briefly, Clara, whose body is the sculpture in the middle of this windward circle. So oh, I, I love I, because she modeled for him too. Um, he, you know what, like for me, like she got I, I, Robert Graham to me is like like the king. You know, you got all these people, the Brat Pack, the Rat Pack of, of Venice back in the, I don't know, whatever, the 60s. Larry but, Bell. Yeah, you know, I love Dill and I love all those guys. But, you know, to me, Robert Graham, to me, let me tell you, right? Ah! <laughs> that's what I say. That's that's the brown man, the black man in Venice. <laughs> so can you tell us about your musicianship can we talk about a little bit about your woodstock experience uh how that came to be prior to that what led up to that um i'm i am like a um i love music and i'm i've always been playing i've always been um doodling around with music i think that's probably more of it i should be more committed to my music um at the time I was, I had a band, um, not even a band. We were a band of people always jam in Venice, you know, and we'd, we'd show up on weekends at any party. We'd always play. And after a while, um, Gary Durden and I, um, from CSI fame, he, he and I started playing a lot together. I had a recording studio above my studio, right where Justa is now. And um, I had bought a recording studio my my family, my father, no, that's another story, but but Gary and I um started jamming and and one day I had a concert at 
a little famous place on the Santa Monica Pier. I forget what it was. It reopened for a little bit and we played. And I'm, 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 we were terrible. My music <laughs> wasn't that good, right? But I had these rants, you know, our truth to roots cascading down, elevating, emanating all living sounds. And Gary would hear this stuff. And then he, but Gary could play, man. And like, like, it was like jazz, you know, he could play the drums around anything I was doing. And, and I started reeling. He's like, I had some chops, you know? And, and then, so Gary, after the show, he goes, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, I, I don't know. He goes, um, you want to go play Woodstock? And I was like, well, yeah, I told you that's my dream come true. Cause I, I love, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> freedom, freedom. That was my shit. Right. So it was like, Jamie Hendrix and everything. So Gary says, all right, well, this is the deal. We're playing Woodstock. The band's name is dedicated to you. It's called Clay Pimps. And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? And he goes, I'm telling you, we're scheduled to play before George Clinton on Thursday night. <laughs> Our band <laughs> named Clay Pimps, and it's dedicated to you. And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, we got half of Lenny Kravitz band. We got a bunch of George Clinton's band. We got a bunch of my band. Gary had a band in New York City. He was Gary can play, man. Gary Durden can play, bro. Check mm -hmm. him out, Colati. And um, I was like, okay. And he goes, how much money you got? Uh, <laughs> that's always the the big factor. Yeah, I was like, I got enough to get us there. So I, I paid and we flew and and um, I left. Actually, unfortunately, I had I couldn't take anybody here. We were playing with Damon and Jessica. I couldn't even tell them. And we got there, and um, this was for real. I was I thought it was a joke, you know. <laughs> Until you got there. Yeah, and um, and but he told me he says bring a harmonica, and I said harmonica. I'm like I don't play harmonica, and so I went to my buddy. Um, uh, uh, uh man, this cat. He he basically he says take a D, you know, and. A D can play in any open. I was like, all right. So I get there and and I'm outside of the studio. It was Jimi Hendrix old recording studio in Woodstock, New York. And I could hear them rehearsing. And I'm I'm pretty freaked out because I don't they told me I bring my own words, don't worry about any song, and just wing it, right? And we got to play in two days. Your and, your endorphins must be pumping right at this well, point. I'm I'm so pumped. I hadn't slept in two days. <laughs> and us, I'm not even telling you about the trip out there, how for us to wait in line and for us to get there. I found ways that like we couldn't get through the traffic. And and I, I saw these two guys sitting on the side of the road. And they're like two rednecks. And I went over there. I said, bro, can I get a couple of those Budweiser's you got? He goes, fuck you. And I was like, fuck <laughs> you. And he was like, who the fuck are you? I said, I'm playing Woodstock. He goes, fuck you. I you're playing Woodstock. And I said, you're in playing Woodstock because you're waiting for four hours in this line. And I said, well, damn, I got the promoter's daughter in the car, you know, Alan Lang's daughter, um, Larry Lang and, and um, Shayla in the car. And he goes, if you guys get out of that fucking traffic jam and follow me through the woods up here, I'll get you guys there in time. And, they, and then Larry and Shayla were like, you're full of shit. And I was like, no, and we drove and we got there in, in time up to the cabin. You know, we long story short, it was like this shit kept happening, you know. And and so we get to rehearsal. And and um, I'm hearing this band. I took the harmonica out. I was like, Ooh. I breathed in, I breathed out, you know. And 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 JT harmonica boss, he taught me from Venice Beach. JT harmonica boss, he said, just take a D and breathe in and breathe out, and just know when to breathe. I did it outside. I I was like, fuck, I could do this shit. I went inside, right? And it's Jimi Hendrix where he recorded and rehearsed, and the fireplace was like seven feet wide. And there's like these musicians in there and they're playing some shit. It was like, I'd never heard. It was my dream come true, right? And I, I started hitting on a cymbal. And then the lead guy goes, chicken, the drummer, chicken goes, don't ever touch a drum again. And he goes, <laughs> and he goes who the fuck is this guy? Who the fuck is this oh, guy? No. And then Gary goes, this is our singer. And chicken's like, oh shit, right? And then he goes, all right, whatever you do, and he goes, you got words? I said, I got words? I don't know. And then they start playing. And he's like, I don't, I don't fucking know, right? Yeah. And then, and then he's like, all right, try again. Find and fuck. 
and I jumped up, right? And bam, I I hit the fucking ground so hard, bro. I can't explain to you, right? And the band stopped. I got up and I go, roots, roots, cascading down, elevating, eliminating, all living. And then it was like, and they start the band, they go, no rehearsal, next song. I was like, my back is broken and shit. <laughs> but then I realized what kind of gig this was. It was all emotion, you know? And yeah. Then, and then, so like we rehearsed five songs and I had five, it was one, it was about um, truth. One was about a river. One of them was about um, a yes, I wonder and how I wonder. They had written it out. How I'm going to get to you. Yes, I wonder. And so all these things we had, and then it was like harmony parts. I was I was low part. Believe it or not, I had low voice. Low voice. Yes. I get it. Well, I get excited. I get all out of verse. <laughs> but um, so long story short is we did that night, stayed up all night, played, slept, got to the show, showed up at this place, Army Barracks in Rome, New York. It was not Woodstock, it was Army Barracks with just mattresses and and I'm telling you, I woke up and it was like only person I was like, freedom, freedom. I kept listening to that fucking, you know, like um that song over and over and over, right? You know? Yeah. And and it turns out it was oh shit. My nephew's texting me. And his it it was so we we ended up playing, you know. What was I thinking about? Yeah, so we ended up playing, you know, and and it was crazy. It was like we what, were, was the, what was the lead up to? Like, okay, you woke we woke up in Rome, New York. What happens after that? Like, what time did you wake up, and what then? Now you're going to the show. So I woke up, and and basically all these people from Venice Beach showed up. Um, Shayla and the art critic, and all these incredible people, and. And we were in there. There was joints like it was like the the Woodstock that you thought it was going to be back in the sixties. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? It yeah, was well, like, this is like the 1995 or something like that. 1999, bro. 1999. It was hell on earth. It was not Woodstock. It was hell, hell. But before that, it was it was incredible. You know, it. We had a great time. We went to the show. We played, man. We tore it up. You know, and the one thing they told me he says. Out of way, whatever you do, don't stop the fucking show. And so Chicken was really serious. The same guy told me to never play the drums. So I was like yeah. really scared of this guy, you know. He was, but he was like, he was the sweetest guy, you know. But they were like, he didn't know why I was there, and I didn't know why I was there either. <laughs> Everyone's like, what the fuck's going on? He's here? Like, why'd you name the band after him? Clay Pimps. I was I'm fucking I'm a clay pimp, bitch. That's what it why. And Gary knew it. So like we're playing, you know, and we were tearing it up, bro. You know, yes, I wonder. How I'm gonna get to you, and the the reaction of the crowd, like 150 thousand people, it was like dead, and and I could realize that they were all so fucking tired because we were in the. It was like we caught them at the lull, right? Yeah. And they told me never stop the band. Yo, stop! And I'm and a walk out. They got we're 100 feet on a, a thing. You walk out into the crowd like a you know like a, a, like a pier. And I'm feeling chicken's eyes in the back of my head screaming, oh, what, you stopped the music? And I looked at the crowd and we're in Rome, New York and there's all these white boys and I'm fucking, ang they're angry. I mean, and I mean, just like the blue jeans and the, you know, the big butcher sh uh, boot boots on, you know, like ready for construction and shit. Yeah. I was like, are we fucking in LA? Are, are, are we in LA? And these dudes got up, man. And the whole crowd got up, man. They were just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Pulled them together. Hated L.A., man. And the yeah. next thing, how I'm gonna get to you? <laughs> and we were fucking nuts, man. But like that to me was, I like, I I have never experienced and you know like, like the amount of mushrooms I ate that day, and then I, I then George Clinton played afterwards and partying with them. Were and, you high when the, you performed? I, I hadn't slept for two days. No, I hadn't, I hadn't even smoked a joint. I didn't even drink any beers. I was on adrenaline like 100%. I was shaking before I got on stage. Um, Did you even was, eat anything? No, there was no food. We barely got to <laughs> I barely. And then, and then finally, like Gary and his wife, she was just pregnant. And 
I had four hundred dollars cash in my hidden in my pants. Nobody had money. The band was already leaving. Gary's like, <laughs> "Hey, you got any money on you, anyway? I gotta get out of here." And I'm tripping on mushrooms. I give him my last four hundred fucking dollars, right? And and I realize that I'm there for three more days. I'm staying at Woodstock. I might as well do it. And then I realize what a shithole it, this place is. You know, like like it's the scariest thing on earth. You know, like they were. I, I've never, I've never seen debauchery like this. Um, I witnessed um, people overturning those things that you shouldn't piss in, like twenty or thirty, oh, man. And, the the and, them and throwing them at each other. And I was backstage with the police, and I was so out of it. I was so in tune. I thought there were bats flying through the air. Yeah. And the police are like, "No, bro, those aren't bats. That's gr- wads of grass with shit." And they're throwing it at each other, and and they and they were like, "You should get out of here," because they all had these plastic face masks on, so they didn't get the shit on them. And they were like, "Bro, you should- oh, this is when Sp- wasn't Sponto there too?" Sponto and I, oh my god, Sponto. <laughs> so like, fill fill the lawn, right? And so finally, I have no way back. I'm, I'm, I'm with Larry. I'm with Larry Lang's um, um the the promoter's wife, um, Michael Lang's wife. And his daughter, autistic daughter, backstage when I see that the stage is being caught on fire and red hot chili peppers. <laughs> and, and I'm telling him to like, we should go. And so we get in the car together. Um Larry, um Mrs. Lang and 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 the police won't let us through. So we had to get out of the car and walk to the crowd. And I'm sort of holding them. And I'm and I could see the 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 storage containers are catching on fire. Things are getting chaotic, right? And and is, it, is it nighttime at this point? Yes, and there's police with armored gear on pushing you one way okay. and then pushing us another way. So we finally made it to the, the the tower, the runway tower. So you could see both ways of this army base where it was set up on, on all concrete. This place was steaming hot, right? So we get up there and all the people up there and there's Sponto. <laughs> Sponto's there and there's Larry Lang. I mean, uh, uh, Philip Lawn and Larry, everybody, you know, all, a few Venice people, but Michael Lang, you know, the promoter and all the big shots, they're freaking out. And you could see from down, they're throwing stuff at us like we're like the commanders in chief, you know, and yeah. they're everyone's stripping their ass off. And I kept saying, you should have had some Lego because these kids are making the most incredible sculptures <laughs> of paper and stuff. There was no water, you know, um, like I, it was crazy how I, I, it was an experience of experience. That night, we finally make it back to our place where we all slept in our beds with no sheets. And we had heard like four people had died. And then then the next morning, no one had died. And it, oh, was, geez. it was scary, man. It was just like, I, I, had, I had groups. There was one point where I was walking around and I had a group of white supremacist dudes who chased me through for about three hours. And they wouldn't, they kept finding me. You know what saved me, man? I finally, I I was like, it wasn't like they were chasing me. It's like anytime they saw me, they were attracted to me. I, I probably saw like five brown brothers and 10 black brothers right there, you know, and a whole lot of white brothers, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm trying to be a multicultural person right now. So what happened was, I'm tired of this shit, right? Because these guys are, every time I'm in this place, they're focusing on me. And I see these huge brothers over there and they got USC colors on. Yeah. And I'm, oh, fuck. Yeah, I'm going. I buy the whole, half of the USC team is there. And I buy these brothers, like three of them are black, four of them are white, whatever. I, I don't know. They were drunk off their asses, man. Nice. And we, started smoking weed, drinking, and 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 they were like, what the fuck's bugging you, man? I said, man, you see these motherfuckers over here? They keep fucking with me every place I go. And I was like, bro, I'm not anti-anybody, but these guys, they gave me the beat down twice, you know? And like, and they're like, who? And, and they said, call them over here. <laughs> that was the best violence I've ever incited in my life. Oh, you know? no, what happened? They shut them down. No, they just shut them down like, it was like, like, like basically they were like, yo, like they held on to him, like, and then they're like, we went to the next place and we, and then I hung with those guys for the next day. I bet. But I'm telling you, it was, it was like, 
walking alone for me was dangerous. Yeah. And when so did you in the crowd? Like when I I had backstage passes, I could do whatever I wanted. But when I was out in the crowd, it was a different thing. And I found an animosity on certain days that was it grew in the last two days. And um I I just and I spouted it to Michael and him. I said, man, you all, you don't know what's going on out there, man. I saw two rapes. I saw, we started fighting, pulling these guys off girls. And when we got to the bottom of the pile, the girl hit me and this other guy screaming, like, who the fuck are you fucking with us? No joke, man. Yeah, that's, uh, that's weird. I was so confused. And then I went back and I was just like, okay, maybe I saw what I didn't. I, I just, uh, I saw people fighting over water and, and but at the same time, this was the height of my musical dream. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, it's, it sounds like, a uh, you're describing a Bosch painting, but the, you know what? <laughs> I told, after I told, I told everybody after the show, like a lot of these guys are professional musicians and they were like, dude what's going on you're a musician i said no man that was the height of my career right there i don't have to do anything else i am a clay pimp for the rest of my life clay pimp forever so what brings us into the present day let's um, <clears throat> let's talk about survival, survival baby survival survival okay so you're what are you currently working on was, and excited about on my health nice yeah, what are, what are you doing to take care of that? Smoking less. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Ditto. Same. Um, no, positivity um, is a strength that can be um, quite intoxicating. You know, um, positivity and and um, creativity combined, mixed with a little bit of a you know spontaneity, and then you're. I'm getting all the eighty. Forget all that. I'm I'm getting poetic now. That's not even. No, no you understand no. what I'm saying? You know, I, I hear can, you, baby. I hear you, baby. Links, hey, links, you, you know? What gets you through your lulls? When when the, that's what gets you through your lulls. <laughs> no, no. What gets me through my lulls? I just create more. I create, create. Um, well, I I've been creating. When I was dying, I was creating. When I was born, and my, my parents were all artists, and um, my grandparents, and and so it was like. I've always, you know, I'm doodling right now. So it's like, it's just inherent in my, in my, in my breath, you know, my air, my ears. I hear art. I see art. I speak art. Can I, you I try. describe the painting that you're working on behind you right now? I'm doing a whole bunch of new stuff. Um, it's hard to explain. It. Um, I'll show you the sculpture. And so how are you doing those? Are those in FEMA, Clay, or what, what do you want? Yeah, that's FEMA. That's, what do you want to call it? Um, Government-funded FEMA. This, um, <laughs> when the hurricane started, I, I started doing these. And then this right here is like, I've had enough, you know. So these are coming out, going to be full-scale characters. I don't know. I work a lot for, I work for hotels. I, I work for the beast. I work for me. I work for, um love and creativity I, I work for a lot of different entities i just finished some stuff for a tv show um it's called um on the block or on my block i did a character called emilio emilio there's emilio i, I don't know but um i do a bunch of stuff you know, you know i i work for i do uh sets i've been next year i'll be working for the st louis shakespeare theater the the i work the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. Um, I've been doing stuff for, um, I don't know, a little bit of everything, man. You know, it's like, what? Even when I had the studio in Venice, you know, the, the reason I was just doing what I wanted there, I was doing a lot of other projects for corporate entities that were unseen. You yeah. know, it's, um, it's, so it's, I kept that out of the spotlight, you know, from all the way from, uh, google to i mean it it doesn't matter you know it's to me it's like um 
I, I work for a lot of, you know, NAACP. I've done the sets for, um, um, uh, I worked with Imagineering for Disney. Um, who no. else? Or, yeah. Do you, wanna... ever, do you ever, let's take a little dip into the future, oh. shall we? Do you want to animate your characters at all? Do you see well, this is what these are about. These are coming out in animation. This is going to be the Adiverse. And we're all worried about the atmosphere. But let me tell you, the atmosphere can always be surrounded by beautiful things like the Modelo sphere. Nice. Yeah, man. So I'm um, I'm sinking an always down. You guys got to get some of these always down over there. Yeah. I mean, Maybe if I can show sure you some of the, um, here, I'll show you what I'm, I'll link some of the stuff up to the. Okay. Yeah, send me some images and I'll I'll put them on. <laughs> but here, you know, like these, no, you can't see them in that. We can but see them. Um, the, the, there's a little glare, but you can see them. No, you can't see them. But yeah, so like. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh, no, you can't I'll see at, I'll be at um next um with a little one in Florida. What's coming up? One of them shows. They're going to be life size, you know. Oh, they're going to be life size. And are you going to do that with uh, foam? No, they're all three th three D printing and all that kind of stuff. So that's Holy coming. Holy shit! Yeah, life size like human like five five eight. Yeah, I got new. I got new right. the whole thing, you know. So that's gonna happen, and um, but so that that's coming up. I got the jewelry lines coming out on um, the clothing. Um, the Adiverse is real. There's no fear in it, you know. It's it's just set. You know, the horns are there. All we gotta do is let the tooth out the jaw and let it flow. The fish is free, you understand me? I hear you. I love, yeah. but you know what? I gotta keep on referencing this painting behind you because it's so fucking cool. I love the colors and the paint, the pop. And yeah. it's like you have a lot of different variations of styles and stuff like that. Like yeah. when it turns like 2023, do you because I, I paint a lot before? I mean, you're always gonna tell you. Whenever you ask me about that, I'm gonna tell you who influenced me the most is Prince, right? Yeah, right. Never stuck to one style, right? Yeah, yeah. So like for me, I'm the same way. I change like the seasons, man. I, I change styles every day. And in fact, in one day, I work on three different styles, you know? Like um, like you don't wear the same clothes every day, right? I do. So I, stick to that. <laughs> I do though. <laughs> but but you know what I'm saying as a metaphor, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't, but but you know, like you know what I'm saying. Well, actually, I do wear the same set of clothes, but they always change because of the paint I put over them. Yeah, ah, I know the shirts. I have I have like six pairs of black shirts that I wear. Yeah. So listen, <laughs> I, what I like to do is this, man. I want to I want to do like let's can we do this in two parts right now? We can do anything you want. Yeah. So cut this right now. Let's do the next thing. Let's do it during daylight. Well, so this is the end of the episode. Yeah. No, let's end of this episode. Okay, and then I guess I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you tomorrow, man. All right. Well, to um, to talk hey, man, thank you. There'll be a part two. We'll do it again. Um, and how can people find you on your socials? Do you want people to find you? Try to find me, bitch. Try. You will not find me. If you want my art, really look out for it. And you want to spend money on it. Come with me with real money and don't find me to just pussy around my fucking bullshit ass all right fuck you all right I love that's you. it i love you i'll talk to you soon all right i'll save us out all right cheers i'll see you in the future yeah thank fuck you so my much art. my art means nothing if unless you believe in it here, here. Not, that's what i mean come check it rastafari Rastafari, brother. All right. I love you. I'll see you in the future. All right, man. Thank you. Hey, Appreciate thanks, sir. Thanks for being on the show. I hey, I'm just, you know, I am what I am. Popeye. All right, let's go. That's it. That was the way I'm away. That took about a year to get him to come on the show. Uh thank God he came on the show. We did it. And uh that was episode 90. Of Brett's with friends, and you can check me out on Instagram at Brett Woods Two Two. Check out my website, uh, brettwoods.com. Buy my art, and I will see you later.
Be safe, be kind, stay alive.